Anybody that knows me will know that I have some sort of obsession with double bass bows, but most notably German bows. And I suppose that originates in a particular circumstance. I never possessed a bow, and I always borrowed a bow, but I was sometimes made to feel a little bit... I had my poverty, my nose ground in that poverty. So when I bought my first bow, I was really proud. And I, since then I've collected just about every bow I've been in contact with. So I have a few dozen bows which I possess. But today I have a very special bow in my hands here. This was the first bow I ever played with. It's by Leblanc. And it belonged to my teacher, Max Runge, in Cape Town. And when I left Cape Town to come to Britain, I had to return the bow to him. But my mother when, bought it for me when he retired. So it's a delight to have this. I still use it and it makes a completely different sound from all the others I have. Now you wonder, why do I have so many bows? When you have no choice in the matter, you play with one bow and you make it work for absolutely everything. But when you begin to have a choice, then you have neurosis of choice. And what I began to discover was that each bow made such a completely different sound that I would sometimes use three bows in the same piece. And for those of you who hear my recordings and some of my students have been to my recordings will know that when I start my recordings, I have a chair in front of me and on that chair will be half a dozen bows at least. And each piece and each section of each different piece, will, I will use a different bow, experimenting the sound always. Now this highlights something interesting about the double bass as an instrument. It's unusual, I think, in the string family that the double bass never benefited from any significant standardization early on. Basses came in different shapes and sizes, sometimes three strings, sometimes four, sometimes five, and the original violin types had six strings and also Viennese basses sometimes. Tuning was also never standardized, sometimes tuned in fourth, sometimes Viennese tuning. And there are players today who use the tuning in fifths. And we also have the dilemma of solo tuning, which is a scordatura of one tone, uh, F sharp, B, E, and A, as opposed to orchestral tuning, E, A, D, G. Each supposed to have its merits. And then when it comes to the bow also, there's this dilemma. There's the French bow, and there's the German bow. And in England at least, or the United Kingdom, there still rages this debate about which is best and why. But the truth of the matter is that whichever bow you use, you have to make it work. Because the bow is, after all, the most important part of the two things that we use as instrumentalists. On the one hand, there's the instrument, the double bass, and the bow. But the bow is fundamental to the sound that you make. And as an artist, until your sound becomes truly personal, it is, can more likely be characterized as noise. Mechanical noise, however beautiful it is, is still a noise. And I mean, this thing about unique sound came to me very clearly when I first watched the video, The Art of the Violin. And I now oblige all my students to watch this video. On this video, you have some of the greatest violinists of the 20th century playing at the beginning the same piece, and then throughout they will play different things. And it highlights for me something very interesting about the right hand, what is unique to us as individuals. Misha Elman, for example, plays Dvorak's Humoresque, and when you watch his bow distribution, it is absolutely meticulous. Not mechanical, but meticulous. And it is that meticulous attention to the detail of the bow distribution that allows the music to speak in the most natural way possible. The other great player that I admire for his ability to use the bow so well is Ivry Gitlis. With one sound, one note, he can make you cry. And that really is an art. A very good friend of mine who is the viola player in the Endelian Quartet, Garfield Jackson, characterizes this small handful of instrumentalist musicians who can use the bow in this way as the magic circle. And I think it's a very apt description. Viktor Jampolsky was a violinist before, and his father, of course, accompanied Oistra. But uh, Viktor Jampolsky is now a conductor, and I see him from time to time. We have this discussion about instrumentalists versus 
musicians. In his mind, the world is awash with instrumentalists, many of whom command the most fabulous mechanical technique. But he thinks that the number of great musicians, those mu people who can harness that physical command in the interest of the music, are very vanishingly small. So every year we meet, he will say, Leon, has anything changed in the ratio between the instrumentalists and the musicians? And I say, well, Victor, I don't believe so. And he says, well, actually, I like it that way. It, re it leaves more room for us. And I'm very happy to be included amongst that little small elite that he calls musicians. Now, the thing about the magic circle, it is possible for anybody to gain membership of this unique, or of this special club, the magic circle, in the use of the bow. It requires two things. The first is absolute mechanical command. Every note, also when you play, needs to have an exact contact point, an exact speed, an exact weight, and everything has to be brought into harmony. But the most important thing that I learned about bow technique was that your te technique cannot improve unless you feed your imagination. So the critical thing for me is that the mechanics of how you use the bow can only be enhanced if you nourish your imagination and if everything you do is driven by an aesthetic desire to know the difference between good and bad. You have to understand what it means to play badly. You have to understand what it means to play well. You have to understand the difference between beautiful and ugly. Also, you have to understand many things about style, idiom, and then to bring those things to bear in the way that you employ your right hand, which is your voice. Without total command of the right hand, one's music is always going to be compromised. And it is interesting for me to watch and to see young players develop technique. And technique is often seen as something abstract, but of course it means a means of execution. In music, the technique should be at the service of the music. Often when I teach, I find that players that have already been taught and have some journey behind them will inevitably have problems. And to fix those problems is far more difficult than to start from scratch. I have one particularly excellent student who started from the very beginning and because he had no problems from the past to have to rectify, everything works incredibly beauty, beautifully at a mechanical level. And it means that he can concentrate on the music rather than having to worry about how to do things. And I like this way of dealing with uh, music the instrument should become an extension of oneself and it can only do that when you command the possibility to be able to do what you like and that means having superlative technique. In the case of the double bass sometimes we concentrate too much just on the left hand. The left hand fundamentally is easy because all you have to do with the left hand is to find the notes, put your fingers down and sometimes do a bit of vibrato. Now the bow hold is complex and we all know that there are so many different possibilities. When it comes to the French bow, there's the Bottasini way, there's this, there's that, the other. There are all so many different variations and possibilities. And every day when I'm out and about in the world, I see all these different possibilities. I see good bow holes, I see bad bow holes. And it, this happens at every level. You don't only see bad bow holes in amateur orchestras, you see them everywhere. <laughs> and maybe that's something we want to cut out eventually because it's controversial. And with the German bow, it's the same also. There are so many different variations. So for those of you who know the German bow well, you will already know that there are established bow holds, like the Streicher hold. And in fact, Streicher's hold of the bow is so unique that there's a bow maker, the Dolling family, who make bows especially with a frog suited to Streicher, a slightly smaller frog. And then there's Frontage Posture, the Czechoslovakian, the great player. And I believe that Frontiček's bow hold is very elegant and very beautiful. And when one analyzes the physical principles which inform how he 
holds the bow and uses it. It's all very sensible. And this is the beautiful thing. You know, I sometimes talk about, to my students, about animated films, for example. Now, if you have an origin and a culmination of an event, the animated film has to make the most dramatic and logical pathway from A to B. And in everything that we do as instrumentalists also, we have to find the most logical and physically the most reliable means to get from A to B. Anything that is too far, too long, too short, or any gimmicks will ultimately fail. I also believe that one should use as little energy as possible when one does things. It means that you can work on endurance. If something is a great effort, you will exhaust yourself. So uh, when it comes to the mechanics of playing the bass and holding the bow, my fundamental philosophy is that it has to be easy. And it's only when it's easy and completely and utterly relaxed that you can do very special things and also take risks. I started off as a French bow player because I'd been a cellist. My cello teacher was Edna Elphick, who had been a student of Pablo Casals. And that is the boho she taught me, uh, the Casals bowhold. An imaginative one and one that worked unbelievably well. And when I started the bass, I began to play French bow. But it wasn't because my first teacher was Zoltan Kovac, a Hungarian, he taught me the Lajos Montag bowhold. He'd been taught by Lajos Montag. Very effective, very beautiful, very efficient. I suppose it was very similar to Simandl. But then, for some reason, my very next teacher, Max Runger, who was East German as it happens, made some modifications to my bowhold. And I ended up having the bow resting on the finger like that, and with a thumb crossing the stick. And apparently this bow hold taught me, to me by an East German double bass player is an old Hungarian hold. And when I came to study in England, my teacher then thought that this looked a little bit strange and that I should have it looked at. And I did. And I changed it to something which I now realize was something akin to the front eject posture hold. And over the years I've refined my bow hold to suit what I believe is necessary for me to be able to play the music that I play. And also to play for hours and hours on end without feeling any physical tiredness or any strain. So the, uh, over the course of a few visits to the camera, we're going to deal with the fundamentals of the German bow as I see it, and also with reference to how the rest of the world sees it. This reminds me of a very interesting little altercation, or well, should I say, a very interesting engagement I had with Johnny Schaefer. Now, Johnny Schaefer was, of course, principal bass of the New York Philharmonic. And at one point in his life, he decided that he would like to pass his Landolfi bass on to me. And I went to New York to go and play the bass. And we we're in his study. I picked up the bass and started playing. And the first thing he said, Hey, Leon, where did you get that bow hold from? And I explained that I'd started with a Zoltan Kovat, the Hungarian player, and that I'd then developed this synthesis of Frankjek Poshta plus the Hungarian hold plus my own insights. And he said, well, it works very well, and it looks elegant. And of course, there's a very important point, that good music doesn't just sound good, it also looks good. You, I don't think that anybody can claim to have seen anybody play really well, but look totally and utterly uncomfortable. It's always beautiful. But Johnny Schaefer went on to say that he felt that in the United States at that time, and this was about a decade ago, that there was no good German bow hold. And he, placed, uh, he explained that this was because of generations of bad teaching, he thought. And he talked about what he thought needed to be done to fix this problem with the German bow hold. And some of the analysis he made I thought was very good about the, f the mechanics of what happened with the bow. And he lamented the fact that these corrections needed to be made. So it's important to realize that the bow is our voice and that without 
proper command of this hand, the right hand, there are limitations. And it's something that we have to deal with every day. Your musical vocabulary can only increase in direct proportion to your command of the instrument and the bow, the thing in your right hand which is your vision of the world. And it reminds me again of this wonderful video, The Art of the Violin. To hear different violinists, all great violinists play Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto, the same piece, but sounding so unbelievably different, also tells a story that we have to be brave enough as artists to develop our unique view of the world and to be proud to share that vision with the world. And it all happens with this hand, the right hand. So for membership of the Magic Circle, using the German bow, we're going to have to master a few mechanics. And then we will also talk about the aesthetic imperative, that thing, the dream, which will always make sure that your technique has to desperately catch up with your imagination.